Welcome to NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network, presented by Wheelan Engineering and brought to you by Hercules Tire. I'm Hannah Newhouse, joined once again by my co-host Kyle Ricky, as we get ready to bring you all the action this up-and-coming weekend from Phoenix Raceway uh, as the Arkham Menard Series West kicks off their season and the Arkham Menard Series heads out there for a combo event. And Kyle, it looks to be a pretty healthy entry list, which is always nice to see as they head out west. First off, Hannah, it was great seeing you at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway this past Friday night. I thought we had a great show out there with the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series and look forward to more great racing this weekend out west at the Phoenix Raceway in Arizona. 30 cars entered. Um, Going to be a great field here on MRN at 7.30 Eastern Time Friday night. Uh, Ty Gibbs in the race. Uh, he finished third there a year ago. Uh, d- let's see, we got uh, Derek Krause in the event uh, representing the West Coast. Daytona winner Corey Heim, Gracie Trotter, Zane Smith, Taylor Gray, uh, Drew Dollar, who finished second at Daytona. Just some of the names um, on the entry list for this Friday night, uh, the, the second race of the Arkham Menard season and the opener, as you mentioned, for the West Series part of the combination event. Yeah, some of those drivers' names also. that are uh, more staples on the West Coast. Again, you've got your Bob Brancotti team, which is always uh, in contention for that championship. They are fielding Trevor Huddleston, Dean Thompson, and Jake Drew this up-and-coming weekend, as well as Bill McAnally with Cole Moore and Jesse Love. Uh, Jesse, one of the names that we've talked about a lot here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Uh, Takuma Koga also in a Jerry Pitts entry. Again, Jefferson Pitts had split over the offseason, so Jerry Pitts fielding that entry. Uh, always looking forward to that race. Phoenix, one that I've been fortunate enough to race, uh, is is a blast in an ARCA car. So to get to start their season back off there for the West Series and also go there with the ARCA Menard Series, uh, that race, again, Kyle had mentioned it on MRN, as well as MAV TV. It'll be live broadcast and NBC Track Pass. Uh, before we keep talking about that, though, Kyle, I want to go back to Vegas. Uh, for all of our listeners, I, I give Kyle a lot of crap here on Coast to Coast. But we were literally in Las Vegas. Yeah. And I had asked Kyle multiple times where he was going to lunch, where do you want to go to dinner? And he walked across the street to McDonald's twice. Of I'm, all of the places, I'm Kyle, cheap. in Las Vegas, Nevada, you and uh, Dan Hubbard <laughs> walked, ac- and Kurt Becker. We have a great, uh, the, the Motor Racing Network f- folks really like to ex- expand their palate. I mean, you guys eat like 12-year-olds. All of you. <laughs> we had in the South Point, we stayed at the South Point Casino with the rest of the industry. I feel like yeah. um, everywhere you, you turned, you saw somebody from, from one of the three national series of NASCAR. And there's what, like 12 restaurants just in the casino alone. And Dan and Kurt kindly asked if I wanted to take a stroll with them across the parking lot and then ultimately across Las Vegas Boulevard to uh, the Golden Arches. And I, said sure you know it'd been a long day it'll be quick and and easy and it was just that so that's what we did uh, on thursday evening before you know we had to rest up for the big race the next day yeah the big race didn't go out which, on the strip like you i didn't go out on the strip either i mean i, I went to dinner outside of the south point but uh yeah then the next day you know for our three thirty crew call you and uh, dan decided to make another trek to mcdonald's but instead on the other side of the las vegas las vegas boulevard and trickle your way back. I really appreciated the invite there. Um, we always love when NASCAR goes to the West Coast. I'm looking forward to watching it from Phoenix Phoenix this up and coming weekend. But a name that uh, if you followed ARCA racing throughout the years, whether it was the ARCA Menard series or ARCA uh, CRA racing as well, Travis Braden is one of those names uh, that became even more well-known in the last couple of years, having won the Snowball Derby just a few years ago, has a couple ARCA Menard series wins to his name as well. And He's recently come into headlines, Kyle, not as a driver, but instead as somewhat of a new team owner with an endeavor that he's taken on with an NASCAR driver. Teaming up with BJ McLeod, who is very familiar with this process, starting a, uh, a NASCAR Cup Series team this year with Matt Tiff, Live Fast Racing. And uh, he and Travis were apparently talking one day about the sport and, and the grassroots part of this sport uh, that we talk about every week. And they have been able to to form a pretty cool partnership uh, involving short track racing and starting a program for, for young drivers uh, that in fact, they just announced one uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's going to be interesting to, to talk to Travis about how the deal came together and what the future may look like for, for this new deal. We always t- we talked about new ownership and new promotion 
uh, folks at the short track level, and it's cool to see new ownership in the teams that are now coming along to try and build competitive groups. So we're going to take a quick break, but we'll get Travis Braden here in studio with us here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 19. 19- Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTires.com. There you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. We previewed the Arca West race and the Arca Menard Series race coming up this weekend. But we've got a past Arca Menard Series driver here now in studio with us, Travis Braden. If you guys don't know, Travis ran throughout the Arca Menard Series uh, quite a few years, full-time in 18 and 19. But as of relatively recently, you've packed up your car, you live in a motorhome at Charlotte Motor Speedway, and you're trying to make it here in the Carolinas. Talk about that transition of coming down here into the Carolinas and uh, ultimately what brought you here. Yeah, well, obviously, long story, uh, how the heck did I get this far, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I, I wish I would have done what, I, what I'm doing now. My girlfriend and I, we moved down here um, in January of last year. I wish we would have done it a lot sooner. Um, and, you know, so many people over the years told me, you need to be in Charlotte. And I just didn't think it was feasible. And I finally just said, we're going to force it. We're going to make it happen. And, and as a team, we, we made it happen. So. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've been all over the, all over the map kind of, I, I grew up in West Virginia, um, you know, came up through go-karts and stuff, did, did a lot of late model stuff and kind of worked my way into the Arca series part-time a couple of times, lucky enough to win my first Arca race, um, in Indianapolis and then, um, got a deal for two years full-time, which is kind of what led me to say, you know what, I've made it this far and I'm one of these guys that's really lucky to even just be here cause I didn't have any money. And it was like, that was a great two years of experience and a great opportunity to learn, but let's take that and let's, let's just go and make it happen. And it's been great. Obviously COVID last year was like a real downer, but um, we're making progress this year. So it's good. I have racing questions uh, and we'll talk about BJ McLeod Motorsports in yeah. a moment, but I want to know about the motor home at Charlotte Motor Speedway. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's a, a nice motor home and hopefully they have you in a, a decent parking spot. If that's indeed where you're going to be, you know, long-term or short-term. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. We, uh, I've been really lucky my whole life. I'm somewhat of a lucky guy, I call myself. Um, I lucked into a really, really good purchase on a motorhome. It's a 40-foot Class A American Coach, which is a great brand. Um, a guy kept it indoors. And so this thing's really nice condition. We got a great price because he needed to move it. And um, so that worked out well. And we came down here, and I knew I'd been here a couple of times racing, traveling. And I was like, let's go to the racetrack and see what it's like just staying there. Um, and honestly, it's been great. You know, it's a pretty clean, pretty clean place. It's mostly gravel. So there's not a lot of mud and grass and all the mess. And, uh, you got all the amenities really as, as a home, it's a little bit of a change for sure at first, but, um, you know, we love doing this. We love racing and, and it, it kind of, it, it's fun. It's almost like, it's almost like you're not living a normal life when you, when you're in this situation that we're in. Cause obviously the goal is to, to eventually get a house and, and live permanently somewhere. And, and, um, so being kind of in limbo, it just feels like every day is like a, a journey for sure. And we'll get into the social media aspect of it a little bit later. But uh, if, if fans follow you or your girlfriend, Jess, on social media, we recently saw you've got the Tom Dawson trophy in there. <laughs> you've got the Winchester rifle. You're literally running out of space in your motorhome, which is so funny to see. But let's talk about that Tom Dawson trophy for a minute. The snowball derby win that came, which followed the move down here to North Carolina. How much did that win, which is a huge coveted win in the world of late model racing, affect mm-hmm. your thought process of all right, it's my time to go and try and make it happen? Yeah. Well, again, like I've been lucky how things have gone for me my whole career. So we kind of made the decision um, towards the end of the summer there in 2019. I was like, let's let's talk about this, and and really, Jess probably is the one that brought it up. I don't recall exactly, but. <laughs> 
Um, we, we were both on board. And so that was before the Snowball Derby. Um, and we, we had just purchased the motorhome like not long before the Snowball. Um, I don't even think we had really stayed a night in it yet. And uh, we didn't move down here to Charlotte and start living in it until January. So um, it was, we were already decided. And, you know, we went to the Snowball. Of course, everybody goes there to win. You don't go there for anything else. But in, in a weird way, when we won, it was like, wow, like kind of didn't expect that, you know. And uh, given all the circumstances, kind of wanted to start from scratch, and um, that happened. So I was like, wow. And that made a big difference the first couple of months here. You know, people um, really tried their best to help us and open some doors. And again, unfortunately, COVID really uh, put a huge damper on that. And it, especially, honestly, the part that I was bummed about the most was we just didn't get a chance to really um, to talk about it much because racing wasn't happening. And, and then by the time it did, everyone kind of forgot about it, which is which is fine. But uh, we just love to tell the story and kind of promote the race for the next year. You've mentioned COVID a couple of times now. How badly did COVID and, and everything that happened last year kind of derail your original plans for 2020? Well, you know, I'm always trying to be optimistic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we didn't have a set plan, right? We didn't have, I didn't have a job lined up when I moved down here, neither did Jess. And, and uh, we wanted to try to stay self-employed so we could maximize what we got out of our time. And, and so, um, in some ways at first it wasn't so bad because we were planning on, you know, a period of time really without an income and stuff like that. Um, but you know, it definitely got tough during the summer months and, um, people, people came together and helped us. Um, and it worked out and, and it's, and we're recovering, you know, really at this point, but, um, it was, it was a challenge. I don't really, you know, brag about it much or talk about it much cause it stinks. And, uh, everyone was in that boat. So I don't feel special by any means, but, um, it was tough, and we're really fortunate to honestly still be able to stay here right now, and, and, and things are going the right direction. Speaking of going the right direction, Kyle had mentioned it. Uh, a new partnership has somewhat formed with yourself and BJ McLeod, and we know the name BJ McLeod from you know the Cup Series, Xfinity Series, uh, and throughout the ranks of NASCAR. But for me, BJ McLeod doesn't scream short track racing. Travis Braden still has that ring. How did this come together with the two of you, the connection, the idea of, hey, let's form a short track program? You've got Perry Patino, I believe, was who was announced mm -hmm. uh, as your guys' driver. Talk me through this conversation, eventually, how you came to this program. Well, um, I'll make it as, as simple as possible. A uh, very unexpected kind of thing. You know, I... I never really had known BJ before, um, or even much about BJ. Um, come to find out uh, when we first when we first you know met and, and started to talk that um, BJ's career path was really very similar to mine in a lot of ways. Um, you know, as far as like what he was doing at what ages and stuff like that, and just the progression. Um, you know, and his story, especially when you look at the actual age, like the years in his life, the things he was doing. Um, you know, he he kind of felt from what I understand that he needed to take a leap at some point to kind of jump from the short track ranks into NASCAR. And he had to sort of leave short track racing behind to do that. Um, obviously they've been successful at that and they've, they've really, you know, been able to build something from nothing. Um, and it's still, you know, still, still getting bigger and better for them every day and every year. But um, long story short, I mean, he just, he, he felt like he had left that behind and he didn't, excuse me, he didn't want to. And he saw where I was almost in the same boat where he was going to have to make a decision to go one way or another. Um, and he was like, Hey, I've always wanted to get back into it. And we've always known that it would take the right partners. Um, because you know, they have a lot going on and they couldn't just do it full time themselves. And they, so we, we talked about, it and he's like, here's what we, we could be willing to do. What can, what can you do? And we talked about a few ideas and, and, um, there it was. And honestly, I, I kind of left this detail out. We, we were there to talk about, uh, we, we went to a shop and met and, and hung out for a day. And um, we were there to talk about NASCAR racing. We weren't there to even talk about short track racing. And when we left that day, it was, it was like we had discussed it enough that it was about making the decision of whether or not to do it already within one day. Um, so it's been really cool. Um, you know, again, for us, like for, for Jess and I, and for me in, in my racing career, like it's everybody, everybody knows that it's so hard to make a living at this, especially at the short track level. Um, but I, I just don't want to leave it behind and say, I'm going to go try to race in NASCAR where I can, you know, start small there and kind of start from scratch and, and maybe make a living at it and be able to sustain a, a life in the sport and, and just have to leave it behind. I just don't want to do that. You know, I just don't want to. So, um, 
it was just a great opportunity for us to be able to, to maintain that connection. And honestly, as two individuals, Jess and I have a lot of ambitions to hopefully kind of help be one of be two of the, the very few people that we see that try to help bridge the gap that we kind of feel exists right now between big league racing and stock cars and, and the short track. So you guys met, you, you came up with the details. What's next for, for this program? So we've, uh, we already announced, uh, heck, time's flying, at least a month ago now, Perry Pitino will be our first driver. Um, I think he's scheduled for at least seven races, um, mostly like car store, Southern Super Series shows. Uh, Perry's from Alabama. So, um, you know, really, really cool young kid. I actually was spent some time working with him today on his, his car. Um, really motivated. You know, I see a lot of, of similar traits to myself. He hasn't had the luxury of having as much, you know, time around cars and experience with them as myself, but his desire to, to do it and not just show up and drive. Like he, he wants to be a part of it. He wants to know his race car and he wants to know what's going on in racing. And um, so it's been really fun to, to meet him, get to work with him. And I, I just, I, I've been around the short track stuff long enough to know that he's going to be in a good piece of equipment. Um, I think I can provide for him as his crew chief for those races, um, what it need, what he will need to be successful. And I think with his ambition, he's going to have a lot of success and I know he's, he's really anxious for that. Um, but of course to him, he just doesn't know yet. Right. So I'm excited to get to the racetrack with him. And I think it's going to be a fun year to to help somebody else out for once too. And we're looking forward to watching that. And I want to go back really quick on something you had just said about yourself and Jess bridging that gap between short track racing and the big leagues. And I feel like I often get myself in those conversations. Uh, They take place on Twitter a lot. Jess will get on a topic and you get everyone that's kind of on the teeter totter like us. that plays in the big leagues, but also has our passion Mm -hmm. for short track racing, trying to bridge that gap. You grew up in the sport, you know, the sport through and through Jess is relatively new to this and she has this passion for it. I mean, what is something I've seen you guys are creating um, videos explaining late models. And that was another conversation (laughs) I was a part of how many different types of late models there are. Uh, Where did this come from? You know, this uh, essential extra passion to do the social media side of things. You know, Jess had posted something today of, hey, short track teams, this is essential to help you market yourselves. So you guys have known the struggles. I mean, what are what are some plans that you maybe have in place to help these other teams and, and bridge that gap? The the simplest way we talk about it every day, of course. I'm sure you do too. Um, yeah, the breakfast it, conversations. You're like, yeah. we literally can't get away from it. <laughs> yeah, it, the main thing is just I. So Jess never was never involved in racing. I think 2016 was when she was first exposed to it. So she's very fresh, right? Um, and even then, it was a couple of years of just at a local track in her hometown in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but I, I, my family was never into racing or anything, but I got started in go-kart racing at eight, at eight years old, you know? And so I was kind of in it for a long time. And to be honest with you, the number one thing that we see is that most of us on the inside, we get a little bit pessimistic at times to say the least. And we hang up on the negatives that do exist. They're not fake. You can't just deny them. Um, and we just hang up on them and we get stuck on them and we just spend all our time complaining really about that stuff. Um, instead of focusing on what can we do, you know, and, and, and we just miss out on a lot of opportunities I see as a whole. Um, so just things as simple as what she tweeted about today was, was pictures. Hire someone every now and then to take some good pictures of you or just do it one time. So you at least have once a year some good pictures. Um, invest in it and individually it will help you. But if everybody did it, that's the thing for us. If we could encourage everyone to just do a little bit more one step at a time, um, you know, the real the problem that lies is, is the dollars, right? You need money. Well, if we can all do those types of things, we truly believe that the value in this stuff could increase um, to where it does, you know, allow for some, some increased funding to come to the sport because it's more, it's easier to promote it, right? If it's, um, if it's more visible. So that's kind of the main thing that we focus on is just kind of just having conversations. We don't even think that we're always right. Sometimes we say stuff, And we're like, you know what? Somebody brought up a really good point in my replies today. And I kind of think that I was wrong on what I said, (laughs) but that's what it's all about, right? Like we can't just all fight with each other and be negative or even be really be afraid to talk, right? You have to, you have to talk about these things, um, to to really progress as a, as a group. So that's our mindset. And it's not about trying to force that every day. It's just when we see opportunities to talk about things, we just give a little bit of insight of our own. 
it's a great mindset and it's a mindset that we have up here in the northeast as well with all the short tracks and asking for for teams and drivers to do just a little bit more to help them out and ultimately it helps the entire program out up here at the Connecticut short track level uh question for you about bj mcleod what's it like to work with him one of the busiest guys in the sport right now still racing just started a cup team with matt tiff and now working with you part of the short track program uh, i mean you know so far he, he's been very busy the past you know at least a month or so um i don't think he's even been back to north carolina for a month with, with everything in florida and then going out west but um you know, really, I can't say enough about the not only just the the relationship already, because again, we're, we're relatively um, you know new acquaintances, if you will. But um, BJ understands this stuff, and he understands um, how to get things done, how to communicate with people, how to make sure everyone understands um, that he believes in them. Really, is what it comes down to. And he's given me, um, you know, Jess and I are really in charge of running this whole thing, right? That's kind of one of the biggest parts of what we bring to the table and, and makes the partnership work. And um, so just really, it's been great to work with him. He's been fantastic at reassuring us, hey, we do what you think needs to happen. Um, you've been doing this for 10 years. I've been out of it for 10 or, you know, for a while. And I want to do it. It's not about overnight success. It's not about making money. I want to do this. So let's do it know that we, you know, Jess and I are behind you 100%. His wife, Jessica, and himself are, are behind us 100%. And to me, that just has spoken volumes um, to his character. And, you know, I, I think, again, it's really, uh, it really explains to me a lot about why he's been able to do what he has uh, starting from scratch, too, over the past couple of decades. And to add to that, uh, we know BJ's busy. Your your summer just got a whole lot busier with that. You'd mentioned it. You're playing the crew chief role. You're now essentially running this development team. Do you have any racing plans of yourself that you can um, announce or talk about? I wish I could just announce, right, a schedule. But, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely be in the car. You know, that's, that's honestly a big part of what we want to do um, just to kind of get the the brand of the team started, right? Um, I think Perry's going to do a great job for us, but we also need to reassure everyone that, you know, I think most people know that I'm not going to get in the seat and BJ's not going to get in the seat unless this stuff's good stuff, right? It, and again, it's it's just building the, the correct image of this is a legitimate program that is meant for a very specific purpose, to help others, uh, to be competitive, to open doors, not just for drivers, right? There's opportunities here, hopefully, for people to um, get involved in the sport working for our team eventually uh, we're not there yet but it, so um, I don't have a schedule anything like that but I would say you know my goal is if I could run a handful of races at least you know the bigger shows I would say number one the snowball derby like I can't just announce it but I, I'm going to do everything at, if that's the only race I ran that would be the one um, but I think you know things are going well it, it's been a quick you know turnaround to kind of get this stuff started but um, things are coming together there's opportunities and so I, I want to run a lot of those bigger shows if we don't have someone that wants to to drive as a client and um so you'll see me for sure you will i don't know i'm really trying i'd love to make a nascar start this year just just to just to try it so um, i'm not going to take any too much focus away from the short track program to do that but there's been a couple opportunities there so we'll see sounds like a tease to me right <laughs> i know say. You've won two of the biggest races in short track racing. Uh, you mentioned Snowball, Winchester 400. Which was more difficult uh, to, to get the checkered flag? Uh, Winchester 400 was definitely more difficult. Um, I didn't even get the checkered flag at the Snowball, so <laughs> I didn't even lead a lap of the That's race. True. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, between those two races, I've led a combined one lap. So um, between those two wins. But uh, Definitely the Winchester 400. That's always been kind of my my home track. Um, this past or when I when I raced in the Snowball Derby and won, that was my first start in the Derby. So um, that seemed easy, right? First try and you get it. The Winchester 400, I had been competitive enough to win for for a number of years and finished second four or five times and had things you know parts fail while leading or just all kinds of issues and couldn't get it done. And uh, actually, the year I won it was the was the worst car I ever felt like I was in. We just kind of struggled that year and we won. So um that was a lot of fun it, it's it's been a it's been a really cool journey for me just to be able to, to remain in this sport and say i've got two of those big wins for sure say this isn't so much a question but i was just sitting here thinking the first time i ever went to irp was i think a cra race 
maybe that you would have been running. Probably. And everyone had already always told me how cool of a facility IRP was. And I went there for that CRA race and it was green flag the entire time. You stunk up the field. I'm pretty sure you lapped most of it. I think you won the race. And I remember leaving going, that race sucked. Like that was the most boring race because you just like annihilated everyone. You were in the West Virginia car. And I just remember I resonated because I had a Boise State car. So it was like the college thing there. But that was the first time I remember hearing like Travis Braden in West Virginia. And I was like, oh. This is so cool, but I'll probably never go back to IRP again. Like, I'll find a different racetrack. Now I've been back to IRP and seen some great racing. But it was just funny that that was my first experience. But, again, Travis, thank you so much for coming in, uh, making the long haul from, you know, Charlotte Motor Speedway (laughs) over here to hang out with us at MRN. Just so everybody knows, I didn't drive the motor home here. I just drove the car (laughs) over. Okay, (laughs) You camp out in the parking lot here at MRN. But uh, best of luck this season. Hopefully you get behind the wheels some, and we're looking forward to watching Perry. And, again, if you want a good social media follow, follow both Travis and Jess on Twitter. Uh, Good conversation there, good short track ideas for some of our short track racer listeners. But, yeah, again, thank you so much. All right, thank you, guys. I don't know if I mentioned it. You can probably expect to see BJ in the car too, the short track stuff, at least once. So, uh, but appreciate the time. Thanks for having me on. If you guys ever want to do it again, I'll be right down the road. There you guys go. So many teasers, so many things to look forward to. But we're going to take a quick break here on Coast to Coast. And when we get back, Kyle sits down with our Wheel and Engineering Wheel and Modified Driver of the Week. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 19. Sir, are you aware you were going 40 miles an hour? This is a residential area. Sure, but I'm on my lawnmower. Wait, am I getting a ticket? No, I've just never seen anyone top 9 miles an hour on one of those bad boys. And mow their entire lawn in 30 seconds? What got into you? Well, it did fuel up at Sunoco this morning. At Sunoco, we know how to fuel peak performance. We've been doing it for American racing for over 50 years. Fuel your best. Time now for another Wheelin Modified Tour Driver Spotlight presented by Wheelin Engineering here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Dave will catch up with the driver with 167 Wheelin Modified Tour starts dating back to 2007. He's also found a lot of success over his years at the Stafford Motor Speedway in both fendered cars and in modifieds. Woody Pitcat joins us. Woody, first off, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's start at the beginning uh, for you. Obviously, we know a lot about your success in modifieds over the years. But, and, and currently, you still run in the late model at Thompson. Uh, but how did it all start for you growing up as a kid going to Stafford on Friday nights? Yeah, I mean, it, it started when I was born. Both my uncles were racing dirt uh, modifieds up at Lebanon Valley up in New York. Um, and, you know, growing up in Stafford, I grew up seven miles from the speedway. So really, that was the only thing to do. Um, so that's where we went on Friday nights was going to Stafford. Uh, I want to say in like my mid teen years, you know, right around 15, 14, 15, um, I got involved with Ryan Pasako, became heavily friends with him, hung out with him almost every day. Um, so when he started racing dare stocks, you know, I would go down there and support him, uh, support Jimmy Peterson back in the day in the late mile division. He was a guy that I would go to Thompson and Stafford with and help out when I could and support. Um, and then when I was old enough to get my license and start driving, that's when, uh, you know, I moved into the dare stocks. I got a, I bought a dare stock from Harvey Daggett, a big Chevy Monte Carlo, uh, was fortunate enough to have it at Jimmy Peterson's house. Oh, okay. I guess it's going to print something right now. <laughs> um, had it at Jimmy's house, you know, for a year and, um, worked on it there. And then, uh, when I was, uh, you know, I ran dare stocks for two years. And then uh, was, you know, able to get it up to my grandmother's house. She had a garage, uh, worked on it there. And then, um, you know, in 98, I moved up to the late models, started in late models. I was pretty terrible the first couple of years. Um, and then went to a, a driving school in Florida, finish line racing school, did that. And then that's when I, I feel like I kind of, you know, took a turn and started really figuring it out, figuring out what I needed to do, figure out how to be consistent um each and every lap and we bought new equipment bought a new car and then that's you know kind of how it started you know really early two, two, 2000s is when i feel like i started um figuring out what i needed to do to be consistent run up front and, and 
run for top five and, run and compete for wins. So those first few years, you were in full body stock cars. You mentioned the Dare stock at Stafford, which are now street stocks. Uh, you moved up to the late models. When did the modifieds and open wheel racing become a player here? Yeah, I still, it's kind of funny because I still say to this day, like Bob Phil, you know, was the guy that built my late model chassis. And he's, he's pretty close to me. I almost look at him as like another father figure. And we always, we always joke, like what direction would, would have you have gone um, at this point? You know, I, I dabbed a little bit into, um, you know, Canon East races, but I, this was when I was already in the modifieds, but I just got an opportunity. I was running late models. I had, you know, just started uh, getting very good sponsorship from uh, David Rowe. Uh, from both TSI Harley Davidson and um, Davidson Food Company, which was David Rowe. So I had just gotten a call. Um, I want to say it was mid 2000s, like 2005 or 2006. It was right around that that uh, one of those years uh, from Doug DePisa. He had called me and was looking for a driver. And it was actually, I think it was on like Thanksgiving Day or the day before Thanksgiving. It was kind of a, a funny phone call. And um, you know, it was an opportunity that I wanted to try. I had moved up the ladder. I felt like I had, you know, moved up and did you know, what I wanted to do, succeeded in the stock division, succeeded in the in the late models, won big races in the late models and championships in the late models. And that was my next step up the ladder was to run a modified. So um, that was when I got my opportunity was to run for the DePizas that year. And still to this day, I don't know if I ever didn't get that phone call. I don't know which way I would have went because – Really, I wasn't even, you know, when I was there, I wasn't even really watching the modifieds. I had gone as a teenager. Mike McLaughlin was my my love, you know. My mother would bring me to the racetrack, and we would sneak in cores extra golds for him after the races and stuff, and we chased them everywhere. But once I got old enough to drive, I was really just focused in on what I was doing with the full fender stuff. Four wins on the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, two of them at your home track, the Stafford Motor Speedway, the latest at Wall Stadium a couple of years ago. Uh, is one of those wins stand out over the other three? Um, I mean, Loudon was really, to me, because that was my first win. Yep. Um, well, actually, Stafford was my first win. But Loudon was really cool just because of the fact that I felt like I've always liked going there. But when I first ran there, I struggled really bad. It took a while to figure out the draft, when to pull out, when not to pull out. There's a, there's a lot of going on in your mind, I feel like. And then when I was able to succeed there and win there, and then to see like Joey Logano come in victory lane, that was a really cool uh, a memory that I'll never forget. But um, obviously to win your first one on the modified series is always big but that spring sizzler one still to this day is the one that i won't forget um that's the, to me that's the biggest one to be able to, to to win in front of your home crowd your hometown um all the people and all the fans that you know that um that you grew up you know cheering you on for so many years and uh like i said my daughter was there she was still young at the time just everybody was there it was it was that's you know still to me that's one of the bigger ones We've talked about you being on the tour on and off since 2007. Hard to believe that's like 15 years ago. A lot has no. changed with you these last 15 years with the family, getting married, having kids. Um, you know, how has it changed for you on the road following the tour now that you, you're a family man? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been difficult, um, you know, and honestly, I don't really say it a whole lot, and I probably should, but Erica's been my rock if it wasn't for her. Um, staying home and doing everything that she does. I know she probably doesn't think that I appreciate it sometimes, but, and I don't say it enough because you're just so busy with the racing and how many divisions I run and stuff. But if it wasn't for her, um, you know, keeping everybody afloat at home, I would never be able to do it. Um, and uh, it, it's hard, you know, you're, you're balancing, you're getting the kids out of daycare, making sure that they're home and all set and making sure she can get out of work. Um, but so far our schedules still seem to work. Okay. Um, so I just keep going. I know I keep saying every year I'm going to slow down and it seems like I never do, but if you look at the schedule, it's a little bit, a little bit less, but I know eventually, you know, the next couple of years, the kids are going to be growing up. Uh, I don't know if they're going to want to race or not. Hopefully they're not gonna, we're going to try to buy them golf clubs, but, um, you know, there's, there's been some stuff that I had missed, uh, with my daughter on the weekends, you know, stuff growing up that I didn't get to, to see her do that I don't want to miss when my son's growing up. So, um, you know, there's going to be some time when I'm going to have to, 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 to decide really, you know, what division and maybe just go to one division or two divisions. But right now, like I said, Erica's awesome. She's, I could never 
imagine being with anybody else and what she does with my family. She's a great mother. She's a great supporter. And, and her family as, a, as well, because, we, you know, we live up in Bellingham area now, which is, you know, next exit from her family. And they're huge supporters of us for, for everything from going to the races, from helping at home. So I'm just very thankful. Obviously, I've, I've always been very thankful for the opportunities that I've had in racing. But obviously, I'm very thankful for what I have with her and very blessed for having, you know, healthy, awesome, adorable kids. We should also mention Erica. Also a winner at the Stafford Motor Speedway in a NEMA midget all those years ago. So it's pretty cool that you guys have that in common. You guys have both visited Victory Lane at Stafford. Yeah, absolutely. We were actually just going through her bag uh, a couple of days ago, which was kind of funny because it's downstairs. And I was, she always makes fun of me that I got a match and, you know, you got to have the matching gloves, the matching hats, uh, the matching helmets, the matching uh, shoes, the matching fire suit. And so she always thinks I have so much stuff and we're going through her stuff. I'm like, you got two pairs of gloves. You got three pairs of shoes. She, I go, look at all these head socks and all this under X stuff. So it was just, it was, a, it was a chuckle. It was kind of funny just going through there and looking at, you know, old memories, but that is really cool. And obviously that's where I met her, you know, back in the day, I met her from racing and racing with her brother. And it's kind of funny that we've never really uh, had any too, too much rivalry between me and Bobby. We've, you know, clank some Nerf bars from time to time, but nothing uh, where we wouldn't uh, sit down on a Thanksgiving meal or, or miss any Christmas cards. So that's that's really kind of cool. As always, thanks for joining us here on, on NASCAR Coast to Coast and being a part of our Wheel and Engineering Modified Tour Spotlight. Look forward to seeing you at the track soon. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Can't wait to get back at it. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 1950. 52. Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTires.com. There you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. With the NASCAR season well underway, short tracks are continuing to open up all across the country. This past weekend, we previewed it a little bit last week. Hickory Motor Speedway, right in our backyard here of Hickory, North Carolina, opened up for their weekly uh, advanced auto parts season. And uh, interesting race for the two twin late model stock divisions with Ryan Millington taking the win over Landon Huffman and Gracie Trotter. During that race, actually after the checkered flag flew, Millington and Huffman tangled, and Huffman ended up in the uh, turn one tire barrier, but was able to get the car fixed and put back together. And in the second race, it was Josh Kosick, Landon Huffman, and Ryan Millington uh, rounding out your top three in that second one. That'll be interesting to watch uh, moving forward if Huffman continues to race on a weekly basis. But this up-and-coming week as well, again, we do record this on Tuesday afternoons, but Millbridge Speedway opens up their local dirt, tra dirt track effort tonight, so Tuesday evening, with some kid cards, junior cards, and then tomorrow night they will open up with outlaw cards as well as micros. Uh, we will be headed out there to hang out, myself and Dylan, of course. Uh, Kyle, what are you what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to Phoenix oh, to you call are the Phoenix? ARCA race and the NASCAR Xfinity race and the cup race. Yeah. There with this little race weekend out there at the, uh, I am there with Dylan. Yeah. We'll miss you. Yeah. I'm definitely uh, bummed that I'm not um, in other short bummed that I'm not yeah. going to be out there at Phoenix, but after, uh, the travel adventures that I had last weekend, I will take a weekend at home. It wasn't that well. Yeah, I guess it was a long day for you flying overnight and then going right to the cars for a race at, at Dylan in South Carolina. So, um, yeah, uh, it was fun to watch you for a little bit uh, on, the, on the streaming platform as well. Other racetracks opening this weekend, Tucson Speedway in Arizona will have their season opener for the Advanced Auto Parts Weekly Series featuring the super late models 
the Outlaw Late Models and the Hobby Stocks this Saturday night. Uh, New Smyrna Speedway down in Florida will host an open practice this Saturday for their season opener outside of the World Series, of course, which is set for Saturday, March 20th, featuring a 50-lapper for the Sportsman and a 50-lapper for the David Rogers Super Late Models. Uh, King Sport Speedway in Tennessee has another open practice this Saturday for their opening night on March 26th. And Riverhead Raceway announcing a pretty cool program for their Modifieds just a couple of days ago. Um, a, a crown jewel series uh, that is going to be four modified events to crown and to uh, deliver the Ted Christopher Cup when this force event series concludes in November uh, for their modifieds in New York. It begins on July 3rd with the 71 year celebration, 71 lap event. On July 31st, it's the Baldwin Evans Jerzombek Memorial event, 77 lap race. On August 28th, the second annual Bubba 100, and November 13th, the Islip 300, their uh, marquee event that they've been running out there for years. Those four events, part of a, a special crown jewel event that will honor Ted Christopher when all is said and done. Northeast always coming up with some great racing and uh, looking forward to watching that, as well as uh, the NASCAR Willow Modified Tours. They get ready to kick off their season in what seems like just a couple of weeks. Uh, but we talked about the Cars Tour as well. They did race this past weekend at Dillon Motor Speedway. Justin Johnson, a name that's been around late model stock racing for quite some time, finally broke through, got his first career win in the Cars Tour on the last lap, passing Lane Riggs, uh, who later figured out, we, we figured out, uh, Lane did not know that it was the last lap of the race. So uh, handed that lead over to Justin Johnson, the checkered flag flew and then found out that uh, he indeed the race was over. So Lane Riggs will be one to watch with the cars tour throughout the season. Again, congratulations to Justin Johnson. But we mentioned it this weekend. You can tune into Motor Racing Network or NASCAR uh, on NBC's Track Pass, as well as Mav TV for the Arc Menard Series West opener. The Arc Menard Series both head to Phoenix 730 Eastern time. Uh, but that's all here on NASCAR Coast to Coast for this week. We look forward to seeing you guys next week here on NASCAR Coast to Coast, brought to you by Wheel and Engineering and presented by Hercules Tires. I'm Hannah Newhouse for Kyle Rickey and producers Craig Moore and Alexa Henry, and we'll see you guys next week.